Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Apologies if at any point during this video I start to shout or my volume seems a little bit out of control. It would probably be because my ears are still ringing from the ridiculously loud music that was pumping out at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Absolutely not to drown out any booze, I'm sure. But anyway, more on that a little bit later. Um, I could just very quickly say, it was like the Premier League equivalent of going, la 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 la, I can't hear you. It was, uh, but we will talk about that later. First off, I want to kind of tidy up some stuff that obviously has been out there in the last, what, 12, 24 hours or so. Starting off with Julian Nagelsmann stuff, you might have seen there's been some new reports linking him again with Spurs. Um, I should stress that Spurs continue to insist there's still nothing in it at all. Any links with Nagelsmann now? <sighs> Who knows really anymore? Um, honestly, with this football club, you know, we've said it in the past. Who knows that if a director of football came in that desperately wanted Julian Nagelsmann and Julian Nagelsmann really, really liked this sporting director... Who knows? It was such a weird move to do what they did a couple of weeks back. Um, that is now putting them in this position where I think any time there's any suggestion that Nagelsmann, oh, maybe, everyone's going to be very quickly like, well, what do you say now? Um, because look, you would have saw it at the time. It, this was a thing that went out there. Um, obviously myself, but BBC, Sky, every media outlet you could kind of say we're, put, we're putting this out there that Spurs and Nagelsmann, you know, had not met and did not intend to meet and he was not a candidate at this point in time. Um, you know, I think this maybe this perception that, you know, clubs do this and then journalists just go, OK, yeah, yeah, and they just put it out. That's not how we operate. Of course we question it. Of course we kind of think, what? As you would have heard me do, I did it in the last video. Um, and as I, in my everything I write as well, um, but what we do, and, and it's very, it's not important, who really cares, but it's, I think maybe people should also look at the wording of how we put stuff. So if we say the club is insisting that this is the case, it doesn't mean that we 100% believe or whatever you want to call it that that is the case, but we have to report on what we are told. We can do opinion pieces, that's a whole different thing, but when you're doing reports and straight news reports, that's what we can report. Um... But yeah, it's it's all about wording. It's all about wording, not only in the way we uh, represent stuff, but also in the way that the clubs represent stuff as well. And, and also not only clubs, but individuals, players, managers. It's 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 all about semantics. It's all about the technically technicality of the things they say. It's it's as a journalist, I kind of I find fascinating to a degree, while also very frustrating. Um, but I mean, you know. Just for instance, the wording of everything that was coming out about Nagelsmann, whenever it was now, a couple of weeks, no, it's not quite a couple of weeks, is it eight days, nine days, something like that. Um, it was all about have not met, do not intend to meet. Um, but as I told you last week, Spurs have spoken to his representatives. Sorry, had spoken, just before that gets in any confusion, had spoken to his representatives. So... This is the thing in football, is it's the ability to speak to two intermediaries and sound out potential interests, sound out uh, projects and things like that, and whether there's any interest. So, you know, you don't actually have to meet someone in today's world to actually have kind of met them indirectly, if you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah. And, and the same goes for people that have rejected Spurs. There's different ways that you can actually take stuff bearing on the exact wording and things like that. Um, you know, it's sometimes, um, you know, if someone rejects them, that's actually the bulk of the time. The club who are being rejected will always come out and say, no, nope, didn't happen, didn't reject us. And there's a number of reasons for that. Sometimes it is true. Sometimes it's because the person, whoever, was maybe pushing their own agenda. It might be a new contract. It might be a new club. Um, sometimes it is absolutely not true. And they, sorry, it is true. The original claim is true that, yes, they were rejected, but they're saving face. And then there's a third option where it all lies within the words and the words used and the way it was done. So you could technically, you know, say something hasn't actually happened. So, for example, 
Um, sorry, I know this sounds very lame in terms, but I know some. I, I get. I do genuinely, genuinely get a lot of questions from people asking, "Well, how comes they've said this, but actually this person says this?" And again, a lot of it is down to people protecting themselves, and it's the use of language. So, to put it in very much layman's terms, let's say I came around to your house, really liked your house, and I said to you, you know, well, would you be interested if I were to make an offer for this amount? You might say, no, don't want that. You could then go off to say to someone, say, oh, I rejected a hefty offer from Alistair Gold from my house. Whereas I would go, I would see that and I would say, well, no, 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 I never actually offered you anything. I just sounded out your potential interest if you were one of the things, I, one of the houses I was considering. You see, it's, it's all in that. And it's so frustrating for us as journalists at times. Um, but... It's the way that the clubs and, and people and individuals get out of these certain situations, which makes it all the more difficult to report on in a very straight and factual manner because there's different sides to it. But yeah, sorry. I just thought I'd explain that because it is something I get asked quite a lot um, is how can one side say this, another say that? And At the end of the day, it's all about, I said the expression last time, shaping the narrative. That's what everyone tries to do in football. They absolutely do. Um, and actually, on the terms of um, uh, with regards to rejecting, it's quite good timing because I have seen um, just before I started this that uh, Dennis Tesclosa, Dennis Tesclosa, um, I'm sorry if I'm killing that pronunciation, the final general manager, is now saying that he's directed, uh, directed, he's uh, rejected an approach from Spurs to become their new technical director. Um, there's quotes around. I think it was. I don't know whether it's to a couple of places, but certainly it seems to be ESP in Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands are, are one of them. Uh, some of these quotes that are floating about, I will not deny that an offer has been made, but I will say right away that it has not made me consider picking up and moving with the family. I came to Feyenoord to build something beautiful, and we all do that together. We are well on our way, and we want to achieve even more. It would be strange to stop at Feyenoord so soon. Um, so, yeah, no word out of Spurs yet on this. Um... Some people who know Dutch football have told me that there is a possibility that he's looking for a new uh, contract at final after everything he's done. Personally, feels very strong to actually come out publicly and say that rather than it just be a story that is about, out there about interest or rejection. But to actually say it suggests there's probably a little bit more to it. But again, it may be what I was saying about buying your house. It could be that it's he's someone Spurs have sounded out and he just wasn't interested in the project and he may have been one of the candidates. Obviously, it's that's quite a kind of a a more recent thing, so I haven't kind of got too much from within um, about that one. But uh, yeah, to me that that would be an interesting one to um, to really shoot down because of how very direct it is in the way he said it. Um, you know. It would make sense, I guess, if you look at it on paper, that you would not, if you're looking at Arna Slot, you would probably look at also the man who works above him and has also played his part in, in helping reshape Feyenoord in recent seasons under Slot. Um, so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see kind of what, uh, what kind of comes of that and whether anything more does come of that. Um, he did also say about uh, being no approach for Arna Slot. I've got quotes here. He said he is still has two years left in his contract. That has been said before, and we've not been approached by any club. Last year, we spoke ex extensively with Arna Slot and his management about the contract extension. Certain things have been agreed there. In February, there was already interest from a club from England, Leeds United, but we said no to that, and Arna did not want to go there himself. If there is interest, a club must report to us, and then we will think about it. The same goes for players. But he still has a contract and there are no clauses in it this summer, so we assume that he will remain trainer of Feyenoord. And the reason he said this summer is there seems to be some indication in the Netherlands that Slot has a get-out clause, essentially, in his contract for next summer, 2024. So obviously that's too late for the Spurs. <laughs> Although, who knows? Spurs could have had another three or four managers by then. Um, but yeah, it's um, if Spurs want him... You get the impression that they can go there and they can probably try and convince me. He seems like a man that wants to come to the Premier League. Um, can he better what he's done at Feyenoord? Obviously, they'll have the excitement of the Champions League next year as well. Um, but he actually had a press conference on Friday. I don't know if you've, you've seen it or not. But it was actually 
it was quite an interesting press conference, more for kind of what he didn't say and the way he conducted himself I thought was really good. Um, uh, an English reporter kind of got in there, was asking some questions as well, very repeated, uh, repetitive questions as well. But he kind of he kept his cool. Uh, I think he'd already answered similar questions from the Dutch journalists and then had to answer them in English. Um, he was very respectful to all sides, respectful to Feyenoord, um, said everything he was meant to say. I do wonder whether that's a kind of a an overhang from what happened to him at AZ, uh, RZ when he went from there to Feyenoord. There was a little bit at the time a feeling that his head was turned and I think RZ actually, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm, I have a feeling that they suddenly let him go, um, terminate his contract because they weren't happy with the way it was heading and him having spoken to Feyenoord and things like that. I think, I'm not not going to say 100%, but I'm pretty sure he left there quite abruptly um, after doing a really good job because um, his focus was started to go on Feyenoord or they felt it was. Um, so maybe this is why he's being even more respectful this time if he wasn't before. Um, yeah, it was a good press conference. He, I'm trying to think of the things he said. On He said, obviously, I'm still a trainer, a uh, uh, coach of Feyenoord. I'm thinking about next season at Feyenoord. Ticked all the boxes he had to, but then also said, it's the dream to work in the Premier League. And quite interesting, going quite strong in the Eredivisie, he said, if my next job is in the Netherlands, then I have failed in the coming years, which I think you know what he's trying to say, but yeah, I did think that was quite a big thing to uh, to come out with. But yeah, yeah no, I thought he, he dealt with it well. He clearly, I wouldn't go as far as say he was exasperated by the questions, but he found it quite funny, I think. He's got a touch of humour about him. Um, dealt with it all very well in a calm way. You can see he's got a bit of a character to him. Um, and from what I can tell from the various Spurs fans that have seen it, have commented underneath the videos I've seen of it, it seems to be, yeah, I think he, he impressed a few um, Spurs fans as well. The way that, There's definitely a bit of Martin Joel vibes about him. He's not quite, you know, this big kind of hulking man that, that Martin is, but he certainly has got that little bit of a Dutch sense of humour about him. Um, and obviously, yes, he's slightly follically challenged, and which means you can repurpose the chance for Martin Joey's got no hair, we don't care. So that's a bonus. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens with Slot. Um, I did also a little very, very small piece in the week um, about one of his assistant coaches, John DeWolf, uh, said he won't be going to Spurs. If Slot were to go there, he wouldn't go. It makes absolute sense. He's a club man. He was there for two years before um, as a coach before Slot arrived. He was not with him at RZ. He'd been a player at Feyenoord for six years. He is kind of Feyenoord through and through. He's born just out Rot outside Rotterdam. Um, yeah, and Slot already has... He also has other assistant coaches, uh, Marino Pusic and Sipke Holtschov. Um Yeah, my, I was kind of slightly stitched up. The headline on my piece, obviously, I didn't re write the headline, said something about it being a bombshell, which... It's not really a bombshell. It's more, you know, it's it's what you. It makes sense. It's a guy who is final through and through, who is very settled in uh, Rotterdam and wants to stay there with his family and, and maybe has as designs of maybe being the manager. I don't know, um, but yeah. So uh, that would certainly be one coach that does not come with him if he were to come to Tottenham. But uh, yeah, I'm, look. I, I'm still, um, he's one of my favoured candidates, let's put it that way. Um, Tottenham Slotspur, I think, could be quite exciting. Um, we'll see what happens. Like like um, Feyenoord is saying, you know, no approach yet from Spurs. I guess they're still doing their due diligence on everyone and there'll be the director of football search as well and making sure everyone fits together. I guess in an ideal world, if they had indeed gone for... Um, I want to get his name right, uh, De Close, uh, De Close, uh, sorry, De Close, I can't even read my own writing, um, then yes, that would have made the most sense as a, a combination of two people that know each other the inside out, um, but I guess you could argue, is there a knowledge of top major league, major top flight football in Europe there, is that two people that might be slightly inexperienced in a in one of Europe's top leagues, maybe. Um, depends, obviously, how highly you rate the Eredivisie. But, 
Yeah, there's an element to that as well. Um, the sporting director, director of football, technical director, whatever you want to call it, search, is an interesting one. From what I understand, I've kind of started to narrow down the um, from from the candidates now. Um, I still get the impression that the leading one is is someone we we weren't aware of, uh, or an unnamed person. That's not to say they have no name. That would be very difficult to report on, but uh, more that they um, aren't quite out there yet. Unless it was Tecrosa, unless it was, and they're going back to the drawing board. But I don't know. I get the impression that, uh, yeah, if Spurs have an idea of who they want, um, they'll go for them quite strongly, you would think. But, you know, we've seen some of the other names that have kind of have been looked at. Roma's Thiago Pinto. Um, Tim Staten, who used to be at Bayer Leverkusen as well. Two very, very different candidates there as well. Um, there was also, I know there was a lot of talk about Lee Dykes at Brentford. From what I understand, he's not a candidate being considered. Uh, Johannes Spores, who currently operates uh, for this group called 777 Partners, which is like a, a company that is involved in recruitment across a series of clubs. I think maybe Genoa, possibly one of them, which is... It sounds weird, but it's actually quite a common theme in Europe. I think um, is it Luis Campos? He I think he heads up a recruitment company that also does something like that as well. Obviously, he's mainly PSG now. Um, but yeah, it's not that weird thing. But anyway, apparently he's he's not in consideration. Although the fact that his name is Spurs would have been quite interesting or amusing anyway. Um, from those I spoke to, those kind of who know. Um, you know these these kind of uh, operators in the game. The people would say Pinto was the one who would be most like Paratici, as you know, like a big operator, someone that um, you know is very much front of house. You see their face everywhere. They're a known entity. They speak to the media. Uh, whereas maybe Steinton is a little bit different. He's more of a back of house type on his way up. Um, not probably the, the big high profile type. And I do wonder if that's uh, something that maybe um, puts him lower down the list. I don't know. Um, there's been talk that you know he might even go to a different uh, club in the Premier League. But yeah, I don't know whether the scale of this job, everything I read about him, he sounds very talented, good kind of recruitment guy. But I just wonder whether they do need someone a little bit more I guess, yeah, big game experience. Someone that can kind of go in there and, that, let's be honest, it's a big job. There's no getting a dancing around that. It's a big job. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, Pinto, it's a difficult one. Pinto kind of fits the role. He is the more natural practitioner replacement. My fear with him especially right now, or for him, I don't know which way you want to put it, is that Benfica apparently, are, I was reading a report from Portugal, um, and among a number of Portuguese clubs that currently have had some investigations about transfers in the past. Uh, and it's not to say that that's true or, or there's anything in it or that Pinto is involved in any way. But I just wonder if I'm Tottenham, with everything that's happened with Pratici, who has another trial next month in Italy, this time about the salary inflation thing, I think it was, um, I think Benton Kerr and Kulusevsky's names mentioned in the report I read. Um, if you're coming out of the farce that was the whole Paratici situation, if there's any whiff that something isn't quite right around someone, whether it's the case or not, if there's even a bit of noise. If you're Spurs, surely you're, whoa, you're just heading off in a different direction. That's why I wonder, if it's, I keep getting told that those two have been looked at Steinson and um, Pinto, but not the leading candidate. So, yeah, that could be part of it. I don't know. I don't know. But, um, yeah, both interesting characters, both very different in terms of what they do. But like I say, I still feel it's someone else. I feel like it's someone else. I know uh, Marcus Croce from, um, I don't know, I'm kidding that pronunciation, Eintracht Frankfurt's technical director who was at Leipzig, I think. He's also been linked to be honest, most of Europe, specifically Germany, a lot of German candidates have been linked as well. I know um, there's an appreciation within Spurs for the way that the Germans club, German clubs do stuff, so maybe that's where that comes from. 
Um, but yeah. I'm starting to wonder now whether we end up getting the director of football first because of, I don't know, I don't know, there's so much pressure. There's so much pressure on them to do them both. But it also is a weird aesthetic if you get the head coach before the director of football. I get that 100%. Um, but we'll see. The other thing about Steinson, he actually was at Leverkusen when they appointed Xavi Alonso. Although Xavi Alonso has quite publicly now kind of withdrawn himself, as it were, um, from anything connecting with him with another club. You know, my thoughts on that. Um, I always thought he was going to be a very, very inexperienced hire. Um, you know, as I said before, if you're going to go for him, maybe go for Ryan Mason because at least he would know the club. But I think it's probably too big a job for anyone that's inexperienced right now. You need someone with... A real strength, real character, real confidence in themselves as well. It's not to say they haven't got that, but I do think that little bit of experience is going to be helpful now, which is why slot, you know, it's coming off the back of a title win. Um, speaking to those who have been, you know, in the Netherlands and stuff who know him, that say that the one thing about him is he hasn't come up against too much hardship and challenges and, and times where his teams have like lost a fair few games in a row. So obviously he hasn't been tested in that regard. Um, but definitely everything coming out about him is, is just the quality as I said last time I think I spoke to Michel Vorm about him um, and he was raving about him and his man management um, just my fear is if Spurs panic with everything that's happening right now and they go for a Luis Enrique and go down the glamour route complete the trilogy of glamour names of Mourinho Conte and then Luis Enrique that's my fear and I think it's another one of those where everyone would say, oh, it's not right. It's not the right fit. Um, and yeah, uh, I think a lot of us media would dread it as well. I don't think he's very good with the media, um, which in turn is a knock-on effect for the fans as well. You know, I know some fans would be like, oh, gut is, you know, too right. That's what you deserve, you media scum. <laughs> I don't know. But the flip side is, is if we're not reporting the things they say and, and they're interesting and engaging and it's stuff that engages you, then you're not going to take it to him as well because whether you like it or not, we're probably your your gateway to knowing your manager. Um, you know, Nuno was a good example. We tried our best. Honestly, I tried so hard, despite Nuno being so disappointed with me so often. Um, I tried my best to make him um, palatable, as in give him opportunities. The best example of that is there was a press conference when he was, the football was so bad, it was so poor. And I asked him a question along the lines of, yeah, but can you promise that as you get more of your stamp on this team, that the fans will see good football? And that wasn't me trying to trip him up. That was me trying to say, say yes, say yes, no, no. And he said, no, I cannot promise that. And I thought, oh, no, no. So, yeah, it's all very well, you know, some people might be delighted that when a manager gives a report a short shrift, but you guys want to know stuff. You guys want information. You want us to ask the right questions, which we try to do in in, in the right way. Um, but if we're going to have managers that are going to be difficult with us, you're probably, as a knock-on effect, not going to be that impressed with them because unless they're winning, especially when they're not winning, if they're winning, they can get away with a lot of things. If they're not... If they're not going to explain themselves, it becomes very difficult. And, and unfortunately, you know, perception uh, is a huge part of football as well. Um, that's not to say we have the power or anything like that. Um, although some fans of previous managers have claimed that I've had something to do with them going. I have not. I have absolutely do not have any power whatsoever uh, to do anything like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, you know, hey. If it were to be Luis Enrique, I would certainly start afresh, look at staff and, and hope that he'd be a good appointment. I just at this moment in time, don't see it as a wonderful fit for Tottenham. And I think right now they need someone with a lot of patience, time on their side, um, and excitement about the job and someone that um, can really has the stomach for a big rebuild, a big rebuild. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Oh, I've got to talk about yesterday. <laughs> I've got to talk about yesterday. That match, that first half, that second half, that 
walk of whatever the hell it was. Um, Daniel Levy as well. Uh, right, let's jump into it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I can't get away from the music at the end. I can't. I know it seems a silly thing to fixate on. My goodness. If you were there, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not there, I don't know whether it, they showed any of it on the telly. I don't know whether they cut away or went back to it. I genuinely have been at concerts where even being near a speaker was not as loud and uncomfortable as it was yesterday. Uh, the specific moment that it really cranked up was when they were just about to start their walk around. It was, honestly, if I didn't have to be there to report on it, I would have gone down into the stadium somewhere within. Um, I know there were people that told me they actually left, sadly missing the women's match afterwards, because it was so uncomfortable. And they took, and they went, and some of them took their uh, children away as well, because it just was not a nice experience. We know it was to drown our booze. Of course it was. It wasn't, oh no, the volume slipped. Of course that's what they were trying to do. But the irony is it kind of had a knock-on effect that a lot of the fans that maybe did want to connect with the players in their life, you know, it's Hugo Lloris potentially saying goodbye. Lucas Moura definitely saying goodbye in tears. You know, Harry Kane who's had an amazing season. Sonny who won Goal of the Season Award and, and you know, there would have been a lot of fans that probably wanted to shout across at them and chant or whatever. They had no choice. They had no option or ability to do this because of this decision that was made with the volume. You know, I'm not saying they were told to do it. Who's ever in control of the volume? But it was a very strange move. Um, and unfortunately, um, they had not factored in the choice of song. So it was Stereophonics Dakota, which was bellowing out to begin with. Um, and actually it was George Sessions from um, the Press Association who actually pointed out to me the lyrics. These are some of the lyrics that were being blasted out. I don't know where we're going now. Remembering you, what happened to you. So take a look at me now. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> that, the best one is I don't know where we're going now. Even Only Tottenham could pick a song that had that lyrics and blare it out because it just feels like they don't know where they're going now. It's a mess, this club, to look at right now. It really is. It's It doesn't know where it's going. It's crying out for direction, leadership and identity. Honestly, I've spoken to so many people in the last couple of weeks from academy all the way up to the first team and every one of them just has this sense of they have no idea what comes next, what the future holds. They just feel like they're, they're adrift waiting to find out if anyone's actually going to direct the ship in, in any particular direction. And that's that's a bad way to be. That's a really... It's it's poor. It's poor to have that lack of leadership. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess this is what happens when you, you try to keep things under wraps, I suppose, and you don't communicate clearly. This is what will happen. You will naturally not only... Um, increase the distrust and worry outside the club or business, whatever you're the manager of, but you also do so within because people don't know what comes next and it creates this instability and, and, and fear for the future. Um, when I talk about communication, Daniel Levy did do his annual address to the fans, which I actually completely forgot about until I, uh, I think it was Guesty, um, if you're not aware, does the podcast with me, Golden Guest Talk Tottenham, which is why I don't turn these into podcasts to those who ask, because I don't want to compete with myself and Guesty uh, very much. We have a podcast. We have a lot of fun. Um, if you ever want to listen to it, Golden Guest Talk Tottenham. It's out there on every podcast platform. We do it every week. Um, but yeah, it was only he reminded me about the chairman's message. And, you know, it's our one chance a year to hear what Daniel Levy has absolutely written himself. Um other than the frequent times he sacks managers and we hear about what uh, who's, whose fault the mistake was. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll read out some of the little lines from it. It started off saying, This has been an immensely difficult season. We made football decisions over recent seasons based on ambition and a desire to bring success to our club and they have not delivered what we had hoped. Your frustration has been understandable and all of us at the club have shared it. That's probably the closest I've seen them go to acknowledging they've made mistakes or Daniel Levy to making mistakes. Although I'm not entirely sure he's owning that. I don't know. 
So what do you think? We made footballing decisions over recent seasons based on ambition and a desire to bring success to a club and they have not delivered what we had hoped. Your frustration has been understandable and all of us at the club have shared it. Are they taking accountability? I don't know if they are. It's one of those, again, we talk about language, we talk about semantic, the way things are said. Um, it almost to me is saying, well, we made the decisions, they were people you wanted, if they messed up, ah, oh, wow. I don't know why I'm doing that weird voice. But I could be wrong. They could very well be saying, yeah, we stuffed up. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Which, again, if you don't know and it's got amb amb ambiguity in a statement, it's not clear communication. It's not. Um, and it finishes off the statement by saying, we shall spend the period ahead of next season working relentlessly to position our club for on-pitch success and football you will love to come and watch. Every element of the club's operation is geared towards delivering that. The issue with that is every element of the club's operation currently has no leader or manager within it, <laughs> or permanent one anyway. Because, um, you know, we all know they've got no head coach of the men and women's side. They've got no director of football. Scott Munn, who's a new chief football officer, officially hasn't, doesn't start till July the 1st. So I'm not sure saying every element of the club's operation is geared towards delivering that is actually true when they're kind of empty rooms. Uh, hello! Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm not going to knock any communication that comes from the club and, uh, and of course, the words of Daniel Levy. Um, but it felt a bit familiar. It felt a little, little bit 2021. It felt like we will bring you a manager who gives you the attacking, entertaining football we crave, the DNA, blah, blah, blah. It felt a little bit like that again. Of course, those of us, all of us, who went through the farce of 2021 will remember that those promises ended with Nuno Espirito Santo. Um, and those promises were broken. They were they were definitely not uh, realised. Um, so, yeah, I mean... It's two months almost since Conte left now. I will be about five, six days off, two months since he left. And no one is the wiser as to what comes next. Oh, you're going to laugh because you cry. Um, yeah, and the fans, I 100% understand how frustrated and, and angry some fans are. You know, we saw balloons. Uh, there were more balloons last time, uh, last um, yesterday afternoon. Um Black Levy out balloons where someone has changed the E in Levy to a pound uh, sign. Um, they were bouncing across the pitch. At one point in the first half, the players were like popping them and, and playing around them, which was um, a very strange sight. The irony was they were actually playing some of the best football of the season in the first half, and they were doing so while slaloming around Levy out balloons. It was, as always with Spurs, a ridiculous and farcical sight. Um, it was just mad. Um, yeah, and the chants, of course the chants were there. They kind of always pretty much start in the south stand and they start to kind of roll around a little bit as well. And there was a banner. I definitely saw a banner. I don't always see the banners because I presume, I don't know, I absolutely don't know on this, but I presume maybe they're not allowed to bring in non-pre-approved big banners. I don't know. Uh, but I definitely saw one yesterday near the front of the south stand at the bottom, um, calling for, for Levy to leave. Um, yeah, it's just... There was this kind of... Oh, actually, there was that as well. So there was one moment where the Spurs fans were singing for Levy out. Uh, Daniel Levy, we want you to go or leave. I can't remember what the exact uh, chant ends. And at the same time, the Brentford fans countered it with Daniel Levy, we want you to stay, <laughs> which was so awkward. And after the third goal went in for Brentford, there was this moment where the chants were coming and Daniel Levy's wife alongside him. You've probably seen the clip if you haven't already. Um, she kind of made this very kind of <sighs> genuine attempt to just kind of just pat his leg as if to kind of like just a moment of comfort. And it was... It was one of those moments that was really quite humanising. Um, and you kind of remember, yeah, OK, he's become this kind of caricature now. But I guess you know, there's, there's a family element to it and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I would say, obviously, his expression was betraying very little emotion. Those who, you know, know Levy 
Um, all say the same thing that he he will be suffering right now. He will be suffering through everything that's happening. Uh, but also he's not prone to kind of extreme uh, bouts or emotional outbursts at either end of the spectrum. So, um, yeah, so it was strange. It was almost like this quite human family moment, like almost his wife saying, ah, you know, don't, you know, you've got me kind of thing. I don't know. I, I don't want to put thoughts in their head, but it was, it was, a, I kind of saw it. I did feel that little tinge of, kind of sadness maybe more so for her that you know clearly any family having to go through these things i've seen football managers have to go through things i know and i've spoken to their family and i know how rubbish it is for them whenever the world seems to be against them but um yeah it's it's a difficult one because these mistakes are being made um and they're not being corrected and, and people aren't seeing lessons being learned and the problem is, is they're only going to look at the man at the top who ultimately signs off on all of these decisions. Look, don't get me wrong. Daniel Levy was not responsible for the absolutely shocking second half that Spurs played yesterday, but he is responsible for the overall thing. And that's obviously why he is getting the criticism that he's getting. Because um, the fans, you know, they're not afraid or not. They're very open to showing their emotion. Um, and it made that lap of... Oof. we'll call it appreciation because that's what the club called it it felt almost quite as similar as you're going to get to the 2021 one if you don't remember that it was against Aston Villa Spurs lost in that one uh, Reguilon I think sliced a really awful own goal um, and the Spurs players did this awkward not quite but almost waving at the fans everyone expected the normal lap of honour as it used to be called but then the stadium announcer told the fans to go because there wouldn't be one, which brought lots of anger. Quite a few people left. Some stayed, chanting against Levy, some of them. And the like players were like shoved out in their tracksuits to do this awkward walk in a near-empty stadium. The near-empty stadium aspect was definitely what happened yesterday. Um... This time they weren't told to go. They'd just gone. they just had enough, a lot of the fans. Um, oh, God, there was a um, highlights video. If anything was the worst description of a video, highlights is the word. Um, let me put it this way. To stop it being essentially a Harry Kane goal compilation video, because that, let's be honest, they're pretty much the only highlights of this season, uh, barring a few odd moments for maybe Benton Kerr and Hoybier's goal again, um, at Marseille and little moments like that, it's been all about Harry Kane. And so little content was there that we there was the bizarre sight of Jaffet Tenganga tackle a block shot, I think it was, or blocking a shot, in the 4-1 defeat at Leicester City. How is that a highlight of the season? <laughs> Can anyone explain to me in what world... That should be turning up in a highlight reel. That is the slim picking Spurs had to work with. And the highlights were booed. <laughs> the start of the highlights were booed. Again, I've got a laugh because otherwise you'd cry. Only Spurs can have a highlights video being booed. Oh my goodness. Um, and like I say, that music was blaring out. Um, I'll tell you what, whoever's in charge of the music did have great reflexes. Because not only was there that music and the loudness of it, but also, at the final whistle, it was like, that someone absolutely turned the sound on suddenly. And there was about to be, you could start to hear a boo go, and then suddenly it was drowned out by this music. It was, oh my God. You almost did it the moment the referee, they must have seen the referee go, and start to blow his whistle, and the music. It was, ah, oh, it was absolutely mad. Um, presumably, just to stop, Everyone on their BT sports, I think it was BT, wasn't it? It was covering the game yesterday. Uh, from hearing it around the world, or I guess anyone's um, video feed from around the world, it was, it was mad. Um, but it was also sad in one aspect as well, because it just only widened that disconnect between the fans and the players and the club. It just made it... You know, there's an element of it. it. It was, of course, it's very controlling. It's very much uh, kind of almost whitewashing um, 
not allowing things to be heard. It's not a good look or sound, I guess, in this case. Uh, but also, just like I've said earlier, it, it stops um, that connection with those who did want to at least show appreciation to those players that they feel had done something. I mean, because after the game, there were a couple of awards as well. Uh, Sonny won the Official Supporters Club's Goal of the Season. Um, and he got cheers for that, or what you could hear because of the noise. I think the, the music was a little bit quieter at that point because um, I think Paul Coit was doing the announcements and everything. And Harry Kane got his name chanted. He won the three player awards. So he won Official Supporters Club's Player of the Season, uh, one Hotspur Player of the Season, and one Hotspur Juniors Player of the Season. Let's be honest, there was no real competition. We um, at work, they asked Guesty and I to come up with four nominations for our player of the season at Spurs. It's so difficult. Harry Kane by a mile. You have Benton Kerr, but obviously he's been injured since, what, February. Emerson Royale was our third choice um, because, you know, I think it's difficult to argue. I think Emerson Royale, uh, Royale has had a, a season when he's really turned a lot of things around. I think he would deserve to be on that list. The fourth, we were struggling you know, I think I know there's a lot of hate towards the likes of Hoybier and, and Davies, but I would probably say that actually consistency. I know yesterday wasn't great for Davies at all, and we'll talk about that. But maybe consistency, they've been slightly more consistent. It honestly, and I'm not even and I'm not even saying that they should definitely be in the consideration for best players of the season. But what I'm saying is more once you get past that three. Who do you go? Honestly, let me know in the comments. I'd love to know if you get past Kane, Benzema, and probably Emerson, who would be other nominees for your player of Spurs season? I, th I would think you'd struggle as well. You know, we even talked about maybe Forster at one point, which would be ridiculous, bearing in mind the little amount of time he's played. Um, yeah, please do let me know. I'd be intrigued to see. Might help us if we have to write any articles about it anyway. Um, and yeah, then there was a lap of appreciation. They don't seem to call it a lap of honour at Spurs anymore. Um, probably understandable as well, because I'm not sure there's too much honour. Um, I'd go as far to say it's, it's pretty much a walk of shame now. You can kind of uh, visions of Cersei's walk of shame in uh, Game of Thrones, although it would probably be too harsh to make them walk around naked while uh, Hannah Waddingham um, said, shame, shame, and rings a bell as they walk around. Um, I still find that bizarre. That's Hannah, Hannah Waddington, uh, Waddingham from um, Ted Lasso fame. You would never know. Um, but yeah, it's just chaos. It's chaos. Um, yeah, poor old Lucas. Lucas was so upset. He's a very emotional chap. He's very in touch with his emotions. And he was, I've seen him cry in so many different interviews in the last week. Um, and he was walking around with his his uh, family and he was so tearful when he was saying goodbye and it was just that's the kind of person I feel sorry for in moments like that as, well, as the fans as well of course but you know when that music the ridiculous loud music is drowning out everything um, and he just wants to say goodbye to there was probably about a couple of thousand and that's pushing it maybe even a thousand left in the stadium it was, yeah, it was really sad to see. Um, whatever you make of Lucas, and, and obviously hasn't quite happened for him on the whole at Spurs, I'd say. He's had some major moments. He'd, look, he's given us one of the greatest nights in recent memory uh, in Ajax with his incredible hat-trick. And scored some big goals as well. And, you know, I know this won't mean a lot to a lot of people, but... He's been so good for the young players at Spurs this season. While he's been suspended or um, or just, just wasn't playing, he was really a little bit like Danny Rose was doing a couple of seasons back. He really kind of took it on himself to be a part of the under-21s and help them out and try and bring some experience because they were struggling. Uh, played about five games for them as well, including helping them out on the last day when unfortunately couldn't stop them from um, escaping relegation. But it's those little things that they're not going to mean much to the, the fan on, on social media who, um, you know, who will say, you know, get, Lu get Lucas out of my club, he's rubbish, whatever. But yeah, you can't underestimate 
what a good guy he is. Um, you know, everyone can have beliefs on his views on certain things or whatever. Um, but in terms of trying to help people at Spurs and young players, he is, yeah, he's he, honestly, I, I haven't heard a bad word about Lucas from anyone in there. And, and my own personal experience, done a few interviews with him, and he's always the loveliest, most intelligent chap. Um, and I'd be sad to see him go from that aspect. On a playing point of view, I think it's time. I do. I think it's time for him to get a new challenge, play regular football. And I think for Spurs, you know, it's obviously time to, to look to the future um, when it comes to, uh, well, quite a few positions, to be honest with you. But, um, yeah, Ryan Mason was asked about what it felt like to see that near-empty stadium and whether it hurt him uh, as, a, as a, a man that's so kind of Spurs through and through. And he said, of course... It is understandable because of how probably the second two-thirds of the season have gone on and off the pitch. But ultimately, we know the fans will be there next season. This club will keep moving forward. And now is the time where we need to be stronger than ever and believe in what we're doing. Oh, sorry, believe in what we're going to do. Commit to it and have people that are committed to it. I always say in football, things can change very quickly and the energy can change quickly. He was asked what must change. And he said... These are conversations and there are many different conversations that need to happen. But ultimately, I've said it quite a bit, we need to commit to something and be consistent with it. Then have people, staff and players here who are committed to it too. And I think that transfers to everyone else. This is what we need. So I like, might as well have said Mandalorian style. This is the way. He's not wrong. He's not wrong at all. Uh, the club, absolutely. Well, you've heard me bang on about it enough. They do need to commit to a, a way of being an identity an approach a philosophy and stick with it just uh, flip flop flip flop between different kind of styles of managers different kinds of styles of sporting directors let's be honest Paratici was nothing like any of the sporting directors Spurs have had in the past um he didn't have similar views on the game he didn't have similar views on the managers that should be in charge um and that's again that's poor from the top that, that's again that's a decision making at the top that has flip-flopped all over the shop um and i don't think mason's wrong there absolutely right um you know believe in what you're going to do commit to it and have people that are committed to it as well it's like we were kind of trying to maybe overanalyze what he meant by that um players and stuff you know, did he mean conte was conte ever fully committed to it um, did he mean players? Were they kind of some of them not buying into everything? Um, yeah, it's. I, yeah, I don't think he's wrong. I think it's as simple as that. I do think um, it should be quite simple, really. It uh, just pick exactly what you want to do. Pick the people that make that happen and stick to it. Give them a bit of time. As I said, um, I did an interview with Tom Huddleston last Sunday at the charity match, and he was saying whoever comes in, in his view, needs 18 to 24 months, regardless of results, to complete a rebuild and make take Spurs back to where they need to be. Um, do I think the board would be patient enough for 18 or 24 months of results not being great? No. Do I think the fans would be patient? No, I don't. And this is, unfortunately, the problem with modern football is you don't get that time to do something like that. Uh, you're expected to be a win-now manager, even if it's a project you're in. Um, so you've got to kind of... I think I said it on the podcast with Guesty early in the week. It's like, what would... And I throw this question out here as well. Would you be happy with Spurs finishing 6th or 7th? Obviously, it's going to be higher than this season by the looks of it. Um, all right, let's just say, would you be happy with a top 10 finish if... Uh, that's too much. Uh, I don't think people go for that. Would you be happy with a top 7 finish next season if you felt that you could see the signs of progress and where the club were going? Or do you need it to be... It is that under uh, selling what the club should be? Should someone be able to come in and with the right players and the right coaching immediately take them higher than that? Now, I'll put it out there. Would you take that? A top seven finish, uh, but with the the feeling that it was going somewhere. Uh, I'd be intrigued to see. It's one of those that we may all say, yeah, yeah, no, i take that. And in the actual moment, we'd be like, get out of my club um, halfway through next season. But um, 
yeah, it's 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 modern football, isn't it? It's it's, it's social media has not helped, I don't think, and the way people view games in kind of moments, um, and yeah, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Um, the saddest thing for me about all the clown going was the knock-on effect for the the women's game because this was the first ever time they've had a double header, the men and the women playing kind of just after each other. It was quite a historic moment at the stadium. And they've had massive crowds at the stadium before for the women's game. But honestly, like I say, maybe less than 2,000. I don't think you'll get an official figure for it for the ladies' game because of the fact that it's a double header and some people stayed, some people left, some people went downstairs, got some food, came back. And it was a shame because... They missed the women having a brilliant, important match. So they won 4 1. It was a bit of a six pointer. They were playing against Reading, the bottom team. And essentially, they kind of had to really get a positive result to secure their women's Super League survival for next season. And they did that. Beth Mead is just. Um, Beth Mead. Beth England um, is so good. She is essentially. We've no disrespect to the others, Tottenham women lay, um, players, because there's a lot of talented players in there. But Beth England is, she's kind of like their Harry Kane. She's just that little extra level of quality you can see in everything she does. Scored a couple of goals. Um, it was a really good match. And, and the crowd that were there really enjoyed it as well. But, uh, you know, it, it was a far better all-round game than the men had provided earlier on, to be honest with you. Um, I say all round because the first half was so positive for Ryan Mason's side. It was so good. If you look at my tweets from the first half um, and everything I was putting at half time, and I think I weighed a lot of people. Look, they were cheered off at half time, Spurs. Uh, I've actually heard that very rarely this season at all. So Mason went back to the 4 2 3 1, which is his kind of formation of choice. It's the Poch formation. And I guess also the slot formation, interestingly, as well. Um, and they played some lovely football. Dejan Kulusevski, he told me out, uh, where was it, last pre-season that he, I asked him where his actual favourite position was and he said a number 10. And he played in that role and he was wonderful in it. Honestly, he was linking everything. It's so much energy. He just revelled in the role. He was so good in it. He's Basuma's first start. Um, oh, if you weren't aware, Pierre Mahoybier and Christian Romero are both out injured. Romero apparently injured himself early on against Villa. I'm not entirely sure when Hoybier did. I think he um, kind of had a knock that he'd been struggling with all week and hadn't managed to shake it off. Um, but yeah, Romero, that's going to be a couple of seasons in a row now where he's uh, missed. I don't know whether he'll be back for Leeds or not, but where he's had injury issues towards the end, although you could argue he's had some in other places in the season as well. But yeah, Iz Basuma came in, and he was superb. First first half. He faded a bit, understandably fitness-wise. But I just thought, oh, that's the guy that played at Brighton. That's the guy that can run your midfield and really dominate. And, and do you know what? Oliver Skip, he made a late absolute mess up for their third goal. But actually, I felt that he looked really good alongside Basuma as well. They, they actually looked a nice pair, and they, they brought the best out of each other for long periods. Um, and purely on that first half, honestly, it was great fun to watch. They created lots of chances. Kane scored one of the goals of the season. We were trying to wonder whether it technically was a free kick or not, because it wasn't a direct free kick. So if you haven't seen it, Dejan Kulisewski runs over the ball, back heels it, and Kane just hits the most beautiful curling right-footed shot into the top right corner. It was absolutely sensational. Um, but I don't think you can quite call it a Kane free kick because it wasn't a direct one that he hit. Um, it was amazing. Um, and just to send another record tumbling Kane, he became the first player to score in 25 different Premier League matches in a 30 game, 38 game season. It's just so important to Spurs. We're going to talk about Kane a little bit towards the end, but my goodness. Um, they, like I say, created plenty of chances. Uh, Raya had a couple of saves to make, but they didn't get that second. That was the key thing. The women, um, they scored a second just before the break, and that was kind of the killer goal. Spurs never found that killer goal. Um, like I say, half-time came. The players were applauded off the pitch. But that was where it ended, the good feelings, because Brentford adjusted. 
Thomas Frank, you know, brought on Mikhail Damsgaard, um, took off Frank on, on Yeka, um, and Brentford just suddenly looked much better on the break. Um, they essentially played the Conte way against Spurs. They they kind of sat back and just every time they went forward looked very dangerous. Um, they didn't even look get forward that much. That's the weird thing. I wouldn't even say they had to get into top gear to do it. That's the sad thing. Um, you know, for Mason, it's such a shame because at half time we were, a few of us were talking. We were saying this first half, if they can continue that, it kind of be his calling card wherever he may go next season. That's his calling card. Say, look, you could have beautiful football like that. Unfortunately, the second half didn't help him because I, I think tactically he was outthought by um, by Thomas Frank. But then you could argue again in his defence, had any of those players put away some of the chances in the first half, it's unlikely Brentford would have got back into it um, and the game could have been gone. But he was asked kind of why it all went um, wrong in the second half. He said, maybe a combination of different things. We were probably asking them to do something they haven't done for a while in terms of playing a higher line and being a little bit more front foot. To do that for 90, 95 minutes, you probably need to train it for a consistent amount of time, which we haven't had. I thought there were a lot of positives in the first half. I certainly took a lot of positives from that. I have a bit of an issue with the whole fitness thing, um, especially being one of those people out in South Korea last summer, seeing Harry Kane throwing up by the side of the pitch, him, Sonny, Basuma, others collapsing by the side of the pitch because of the work um, they were being put through. Um, you know, it, it's, it was the most, you know, the, the pitch long laps, uh, pitch long runs after an hour and a half training session. If that doesn't build up your fitness to at this stage of the season, be able to press teams and play high energy football. I, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. So I don't entirely buy that. You could argue that maybe they're, um, what do you call it? Their um, fitness sessions and training sessions maybe have been slightly different. Obviously, Ventroni passing away so suddenly and tragically and, and sadly. Whether that's had any impact, I don't know. But still, yeah, it didn't quite work for me. Especially games week a week apart now. Um, yeah, I wasn't entirely buying that one as well. I was looking at the stats, you know. They had, I suppose, had 22 shots on goal, eight on target, and 62% of the possession. But it didn't make any difference because they weren't ruthless like Brentford were. Brentford only had four shots on target and scored three of them. Uh, Brian Mbuemo's low, both of his strikes were straight into the bottom corner. I don't think um, Forster really could have done much about it. The second one was not a good look for Davies, especially. He was absolutely outstri uh, outstripped for pace. It reminded me a little bit of the one where he probably gets reminded of quite a lot was the um, uh, Sadio Mane for Liverpool way back at Anfield when Mane just went vroom, right by him. Um, and it was a bit like that. He kind of almost decided, I'm not going to be able to keep up with him. If you watch him, like Davies always decided, I'm going to run diagonally and try and get into the box quicker that way using angles. Um, and it didn't work because his finish was lovely. First one, technically, I think mean, Davy showed him onto his stronger foot as well, which probably isn't the greatest thing in the world. But I don't think he was only at fault for that goal. There's a lot of people that let him drift in far too easily in the field. And then, unfortunately, the third one, uh, like I say, was, was Skippy's a bit of a mess. He had a throw to him, didn't control it properly, didn't ever really have it under control. Um, was pressed. Ball was one back. It was worked to uh, Johan Wisser, and, and he kind of like dinked it over Forster as he ran in, um, ran out to him. And look, Skippy was not the only one who was really good first half, near anonymous in the second. There were so many players. All of the attacking players just disappeared off the face of the earth. I thought Sonny was really bright in the first half and dangerous. Kudusevsky was. Dan Juma came in for his first start, and he was quite he had a good chance with a header. Sonny put in some lovely crosses. One of them, Dan Juma, headed just wide. Second half, all of that just dried up until right at the end when they had a few opportunities. Richardson had a couple of headers saved by Raya. One pushed onto the um, post, but yeah, just uh, wasn't good enough. Was not good enough. It's all very well kind of um, kind of yeah, all, all very good kind of. Um, 
talking about lovely football in the first half, but also if you're not going to maintain that across 90, 95 minutes, then yeah, unfortunately it means very little at the end of the day. It did show that there's qualities there in some of these players to do that, but just clearly not enough quality to um, see these things out. Um, so here we are with one match left. One match left. The trip to Leeds. Uh, obviously still waiting to find out if I've got my accreditation, but I've got my train book just in case. I shall be heading up there. Um, it's a season that's brought so many more lows than highs. It's been a gruelling one. I'm definitely ready for... I'm not going to get a break because I've still got to write about the manager staff, director of football staff, transfer stuff eventually. This is the thing. You can't even have transfer stuff right now because you can't do that. <laughs> it's like If you see any transfer story, it purely would be based off maybe the recruitment and scouting team having looked at someone because they are not going to make any decisions on players until they have a director of football and a manager in because that would be... I was going to say it would be nonsensical, but we know they've sometimes done nonsensical things before. But uh, yeah, but I do. I, I need a little, some kind of break. I don't think I've got any holiday now for a while, but um, I'll have days off. Don't worry. There'll be days off when things might happen. Although I feel like there's a few days off and recently nothing as good's happened. I think I might be going the other way. I think my, my days off happen. Bad stuff's been happening at Spurs. So maybe you don't want me to have a day off. Um, yeah, I'd say a month or so, and then the tour, and then new people, new things, hopefully change. Um, but we still have this one game before we can start thinking about that. Spurs are eighth. There remains the chance of Conference League football next season, although it is no longer in their hands. So essentially, they have to beat Leeds, which is no given. Bear in mind, Spurs have not won outside London since October. And Leeds, Ellen Road is going to be very noisy. Um, Villa would also have to lose their final game of the season um, at Brighton. Let me just double check. Do they have to lose or can they draw? They can. Uh, technically, yeah. So they've got to win. If, if Villa don't win their last game of the season, then Spurs could overtake them with a win. Um, so there's that. That is the... Um, that is one chance of some kind of formal European football. There is the even slimmer chance of Europa League football. Um, let me just explain to you how that would happen. So Brighton would have to, at best, lose two of their last three matches and draw one. And the fact that they, this afternoon, are hosting relegate Southampton makes it a very unlikely scenario. By the time you watch this, it may be a scenario that cannot happen anymore. So, uh, so uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Leeds have literally just scored as I'm recording this um, right now. Um... Let's be honest, any form of European football is a prize. Uh, it would be a prize that this turgid Tottenham team does not deserve in any real way. It would be a nice little bonus, I think, for the fans that like to travel to these games. And for me, I wouldn't have the long midweeks of having to think of things to write about. And it's another avenue to a potential trophy. So I wouldn't be against it at all. I know some people are. But, um, yeah, it's, they're going to have to come out with something different next weekend, Spurs, to do that. And Villa are playing very well, so there's no um, indication whatsoever that Villa um, are going to be rolled over by Brighton at all. Because um, I think Brighton, presumably at that point, will, should they beat Southampton today, are going to be in a scenario where their position is not really affected. I mean, they can finish higher or lower, maybe. Sorry, I keep looking at the Premier League table because there's so many permutations in these things. They've got two games in hand on Liverpool, six points. No. No, they're not gonna um they're not gonna catch up there with anything anyway, so they can't really affect too much, to be honest. Um yeah, I like Ellen Road though. It's a nice traditional stadium, so I'm looking forward to that aspect of it. If it's the only way you're gonna sign up for a season, it's not a bad place to do it. Um but here's some more stats for you. So, Spurs are going to finish this season. Um, they're going to finish for only the second time in the last 14 Premier League scenes, uh, seasons with 60 or fewer points at the most. They got 59 points in 2020. Um, so the season that uh, Poch left and Jose took over halfway through. I mean, hey, what are they on? 57 now? 
I think it's 57, yeah, 57 points. So it may be they even end up getting less than that. So it's no guarantee whatsoever that that's going to be the case. Um, and here's another one for you. Only the second time a team has managed to score more than 60 goals in a Premier League season and also concede more than 60. That's disgusting that Spurs have conceded more than 60 goals in a season. And do you know the only time it happened to a team? It was Tottenham <laughs> in the 2007-8 campaign. It's a disgrace that the defence has been that bad. I'm sorry. If you need, I know it's the whole team have got to kind of um, defend as a unit at times as well. But if any suggestions that that defence is absolutely fine and doesn't need strengthening, please look at the goals against uh, Tally. Um, anyone involved in the decision making as well. Um, look, I've said the word enough. Change. Spurs need change. Hopefully. As I say, it will come naturally through the flood of new people that we're going to see throughout the spine of the club. Oh, it looked like I was about to do something religious there. The spine of the club um, in very prominent positions. Spurs want to get their head coach and director of football in as soon as possible um, as the season ends in England, of course, across Europe as well, when it becomes less of a distraction for everyone involved. But yeah, they definitely want to get tied up sooner rather than later. You don't want it like the Paratici knew no time of dragging right towards the brink of pre-season starting and no one knowing what's happening. Because like I say, it influences your transfers in and out as well. Because you kind of forget that a new manager has to look at all of their players. They have to make decisions. Uh, you know, There may be some decisions that are kind of made for them, like players, maybe if there's a good offer and it's that time and the player wants to go and they're clearly not going to make it at Spurs, that decision will be made. But on the whole, there's quite a few players that the new manager will want to look at. So... You need them in to properly analyse the squad. And, and it may need, not be that they need to look at them in the person. It'll be video analysis. They probably pour over everything about them and decide. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, people will say some form of change needs to come at the very top with Levy. And in essence, regardless, some form of change is going to happen there because... Daniel Levy is expected to hand over the day-to-day -day running of all the football departments to Scott Munn um, and the decision-making. Um, although many people, including those who know Daniel Levy, will wonder just how much control he will be willing to relinquish. But do you know what? It's <sighs> Scott Munn's success will be very quickly defined by just how much autonomy he's given and how much power Levy does hand over to him. Um... Because, look, history has suggested that Levy's decisions on the pitch have fallen way, way short of some of the decisions he's made off the pitch in terms of the business and the brand or whatever you want to call it. Even on Saturday's address, you know, he spoke about football decisions that had failed. So it's there. He, he's admitting that decisions have not worked as he wanted. So if ever there was a time to step back and let someone else do that, this is the time. And I do wonder whether... Some fans would be happy enough if Daniel Levy were to be the man that just looks after the business aspect of things, the stadium, the brand, um, I guess more financial aspects, whereas some, well, Scott Munn was just given total control of everything that happens on the pitch. Um, but I guess it's difficult because both go hand in hand, you know. Can you truly um, make decisions you want in the football aspect within the parameters that are set from the financial aspect? I don't know. I don't know. Um, they're going to have to make some calculated gambles. They are. They're going to have to go with uh, their gut on stuff. They're going to have to... Obviously, a lot of stuff's going to be information, analytics-based, but... There's going to be elements when it comes to not only the head coach, but the players as well that come in of, yeah, calculated gambles. That's the only word I can use that kind of makes the most sense. Um, is he a gambling man, Levy? I don't know. But look, for me, in an ideal world, everything would be rebuilt around what Harry Kane wants. I know that no player should be bigger than the club, and I know that's you know sacrilege to, to most kind of older football fans um, that one player should ever have such a powerful thing. You know, obviously people speak about Mbappe and PSG and whether he has too much influence there. 
But I just feel when you've got someone like Harry Kane, he's been carrying this club on his shoulders for so long. Honestly, he must be drained by it. I still cannot get my head around the fact that he's scored 28 Premier League goals this season. And just out of interest, that would be enough to win the Golden Boot in the Premier League. Not only last season, but in 19 of the seasons since the Premier League began 31 years ago. It's just crazy. He's got 30 in all competitions. Absolute madness. But look, I know player control is a big door to open and, and whether Daniel Levy would ever agree to anyone else having that kind of say, especially a player. But I think Kane, if anyone, deserves to have a major say in what comes next. Um, especially if he is to stick around. If he wants to stick around for the long term, I feel that he should be able to play a major part in what that long term looks like. Um, and I think he's earned that chance as well. He's been really vocal in recent weeks about the lost values at the club and how much things need to change, improvements. He's kind of been talking about improvements next season. It's one of those where, if you want to be really positive, you could talk about the fact that he's talking about next season at Spurs. If you want to be cynical, you could say, well, he could just be talking about the club need to make improvements, whether he's there or not. Um, he did an interview with Peter Crouch at Hotspur Way for the BT Sport ahead of the game. Uh, he was asked kind of what's gone wrong and he said maybe it's a lack of confidence in the squad, a lack of belief that we're a good team, we've got some great players. It's something that's obviously going to have to change for next season. Um, he was asked about whether he's targeting Alan Shearer's all-time top goalscorer record. He said, yeah, I think so. Re records are always strange because when he first started out, I was never someone that looked at Jimmy Graves' record or, Greaves record or Wayne Rooney's record and I thought, I want to beat that. It's similar with the Shearer record now. At the start, it was never that I wanted to set out to beat that record, but it would be something I'd love to achieve, for sure, to be the Premier League's all-time top goalscorer. But it's still a few years away yet, so I'm trying not to think about it too much. Um, Mason was asked whether... Um, I knew what the answer was going to be to this. Someone asked him whether he felt that, you know, was Harry Kane saying goodbye in that uh, lap around the pitch? And he said, no. He waves at the crowd every season. I remember sitting here two years ago and you guys were convinced he was leaving, saying the same thing. It's the last home game of the season, so he wants to show his appreciation to the, for, the, for the support he's received, and we've all received this season. Um, I didn't see this, but I've um, I heard about it, I read about it afterwards, that Crouch, after doing the interview, was asked what he felt that Kane actually wanted to do, and he kind of, I think hinted that he had asked him that, that well actually it's, it's in the, the I've got the quotes he said I did ask him the question if that was his, going to be his last home game to Spurs and he was very diplomatic in his answer I don't think even he knows he might have ambitions to go somewhere else and potentially win a trophy but it's not just down to him he still has a year left and there's a man at the club who, that doesn't want to lose his star player and what it, would it mean to these fans to lose a player of Kane's calibre where can he go? Manchester City is sewn up now. Manchester United is the only real option I can see. You can't go to Chelsea. You can't go to Arsenal. Newcastle is potentially an option, but I still feel that's a sideways move. Newcastle have got great potential, but I feel like he might as well stay at Tottenham. And this is the thing for him. It's like, even Man U, for me, I don't think they're any more of a huge guarantee of a trophy. Um, of course, you know, looks like they probably will have Champions League football. Um, but still, I wouldn't. Say, I'd say City for me are the only side you can go to and be guaranteed of some sort of silver, sort of silverware now. And I don't think right now with Haaland, that's a place for a striker really to go. Um, you know, you could argue that maybe at the end of his contract, Kane, maybe City, maybe Haaland might have gone to Real Madrid. Maybe I don't know. He might stay there. Um, I know there was a talk about a, a clause in his deal. But I think Pep absolutely said that that wasn't the case. So no. the other problem for Kane right now in this summer is the pressure on, on Levy. It's not going to allow Levy really to say, yeah, yeah, sure, Harry, you can go now. I just, I just can't see it at this point in time. Um, Spurs continue to state very clearly that they've got no intention of letting Kane go. And if you look at it just on a face value... At a time when the fans are absolutely, you know, so many of them are fed up with Levy, are calling for him to leave and everything. The pressure on him has never been that high. He's had, you know, been in charge of a, a season this awful. Um, he was seen not to step in to get Pochettino, who is now going to go to Spurs' local rivals. I just think if he were to let Kane go, 
while I think some people would not begrudge Kane to be able to go for everything he's done for Spurs, for Levy, honestly, it would be un unbearable, surely, untenable, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, yeah. I know some people say that, oh, you can't afford to let him go for a free in 2024. I still think I would pay 80 million, whatever, 100 million, to have him at Spurs for another season. I really would. Because you look at the stats, he scored almost half of Spurs goals in the Premier League this season. He's responsible. I saw a stat to say like 50 plus percent of their points this season because of the goals he scored. Um, There's no guarantee that you spend 80 million on his replacements and they get anywhere near the contribution that he's made. It's just... Honestly, in 2024 as well, the power shifts back into Kane's hands. Um, but also, in my mind, that gives Spurs another year to try to convince him of what they're trying to do. And, and who knows, if he spends another season and thinks, oh, do you know what, I'm actually quite enjoying what's happening here now. Let's say, I don't know, purely hypothetically, Arne Slot comes in, they play some lovely football, they get plaudits from everywhere maybe they maybe they win a, a cup an FA Cup or a Carabao Cup or whatever and they just have a really enjoyable season and Kane thinks do you know what yeah let's have a bit of this let's have it I, I, you know this maybe is going somewhere maybe this can be can allow me to do what I've always wanted to do which is is win silverware consistently with Spurs or just win silverware with Spurs um I honestly think that just having that extra year if Kane kind of just accepts it's going to happen then I think it kind of ends up being a win-win. Um, Spurs get an incredible world-class player for another year, and they get that opportunity to convince him. And who knows what happens? Um, yeah, because Spurs need to change around him. You know, they need to change for the better. They need to... He's their life jacket, really. If they're in that ocean... Um, and I'd say their boat's probably capsized. Here's their, their life jacket, really, stopping them from plummeting down that table. You take the goals out. And I know it's easy to say take the goals out, and, but I still don't think you replace it with the same amount of goals. They would be so far down that table. Um, and my fear is is the what's happening at other clubs. You know, Man City have been amazing. And I know, you know, people talk about the way they're put together, but still, they coach so well. And they just play such wonderful football. And they're only going to get stronger. They will. Arsenal are going to want to make up for this end of the season. They're going to show some transfer power as well, you would think, with the extra money that's going to have come in from you know, the popularity around the club increasing, the Champions League football that they'll have next season as well. Um, Newcastle are going to start to wield their financial might now. You just know it. Man U look like probably going to have some kind of new owners or at least ownership. Um, and they're going to start spending away. Of course they will. They always try and buy these big players each summer. Liverpool are going to look to get back to where they were. Uh, Chelsea, we know are going to spend a lot of money, and they're going to have Pochettino trying to sort them out as well. Brighton will probably lose some star names, but if anyone is set up to just bounce back and get even stronger because of their brilliant recruitment, it's Brighton. In an ideal world, you just want to take what they're doing and bring it in to Spurs. Um but fair play to them, and ironically, it's it's the Spurs element there and Paul Barber as well. Even Villa, Unai Emery has really got them going in the right direction. I think they'll only improve next season as well. And on top of that, you've got clubs below that I think will improve and get. And it's each season it becomes more and more difficult to beat sides in the Premier League, regardless of where they are in the table. Um, Spurs have to change, they have to adapt, they have to improve, they have to be a better version of themselves. The squad needs an overhaul, it does, it does. There's an element, there's a very small core of players you can build around, but I think around it is just so much more to be done. Um, yeah, yeah, there's so many, there's so many changes that need to be made. The sheer volume of players coming back to the club. Um, many of them on loan that are going to probably have to go out again. Um, you know, you may just end up seeing deals with some of the older players just torn up, I guess, because it's cheaper to let them go because they're um, on, on huge wages. You know, maybe Larice, maybe they allow that to happen. Maybe even someone like Harry Winks, if, if they can't run the club, 
It's a difficult one because like people are saying this with people like Tongi, but Tongi's still got I think two years left. In my mind, you might as well loan him out. I know we all just want to say, I'll just get him out of the club, or people say, but from a financial point of view, loaning him out for another season, let's say, and someone paying even half of his wages is actually financially more sense unless he decides to take a big cut by mutually um, uh, cancelling his contract. Yeah, there's so many things we're going to see in the weeks ahead. But again, you've got to wait and see what the new coach and director of football want. Oh, it's frustrating. It really is. Um, look, no amount of ear-busting music can drown out uh, the cries around what is a, a bit of a sinking Tottenham Hotspur right now. Daniel Levy's got to listen to what people are saying. He's got to heed the advice of those people he's bringing in. If you're bringing them in because they're experts and the ones that you really want, the top candidates, then you've got to listen to what they're saying. Um, Realise their expectations and make them happen. Make those expectations for Harry Kane happen as well. We'll always go back to Tottenham's motto. To dare is to do. It's never felt less of an accurate tag for a football club that proclaims it to be its motto than it does right now. It's time to change things. It's a time to dare. And it's long past time to do. It really is. Um, yeah. Lots of things to happen at Spurs in the weeks ahead, let alone the months ahead. Um, hey, we're going to have lots of stuff to talk about. We're going to have lots of stuff to be exasperated about. Hopefully we'll have some stuff to be happy about. Um, one more week to go of the season. Let's see how that goes and... and what we have coming out of it, um, let's hope the pressure on Levy doesn't make him panic and that he continues, uh, or not continues, that he makes the right decisions um, and then allows others to make those decisions beneath him as well. Because um, it's time to... Uh, it's time. It's just time. It's just time to make things so much better at Tottenham Hotspur. And it's just frustrating that a lot of people can see the things that need to change and need to happen, but unfortunately not everyone inside the club always seems to see these same things. But um, it's not to say the outside world is always right. Um, often with team formations you can find that with the fans, and us as journalists often say, we want this, and it happens as like, ooh, that's rubbish. Um, but in the grand overarching scheme of Tottenham Hotspur, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Big old rebuild. Uh, and to be honest, I'm all there for it. Like I've said before, and I stick with it, as long, I, I'm quite excited about the prospect of change, but it needs to be change. It needs to not be a half-measured, half-assed change. It needs to be a proper thing. Um, so, yeah. Right, I'm going to head off and enjoy the rest of my Sunday and try not to think about Spurs if I can for just a few hours until I'm back at work tomorrow. Um, and, yeah, as always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.